How's it going, everybody? It's been a little while. Been busy growing my hair. You don't grow something like this overnight, let me tell you. Uh, but been good. Good to be back. Got a lot of things done. Uh, business is starting to return towards normal-ish, even though flights are still delayed. So I will be going to the airport either super late tonight or early in the morning for. A ton of plants which we've been doing okay keeping most in stock there's some that are just nowhere to be found like java moss most of the mosses and uh, you know so to alleviate my first my first thing I want to do today is alleviate customer service anything we're sold out of we don't really have an ETA on when it's coming back in I can say every day I have a meeting with Randy and we go over what's out of stock where is it how soon if everything goes right so know that where when's dwarf aquarium bulbs coming back in i don't know we harass the vendor every week and they say we're hoping next week and then we do that again next week and we do that again next week and that's as good as we got for you guys so we are trying i will say we're down to about 30 items that are out of stock on the website which when you have over 500 <clears throat> that's a decent ratio in terms of what's going on so you know, we're doing okay but a lot of things on the way are a cargo container with a bunch of goods are coming from uh, from China and it's gonna restock some things like sponge filters and some other desperately needed stuff we we're testing out new <clears throat> pardon me testing out some new pump heads uh, they will hopefully fill the gap well so instead of there being a, a huge delay on pump heads for easy green right here uh, there is a, a, a manufacturer that says we could get you pump heads in 90 days well that about lines up with the uh-oh time we're out of pump heads for us so we're gonna we're testing those pump heads and if those work out great there hopefully will be no disruption in easy green so that's that's good news and uh, you know yeah what, what else is oh the aquarium co-op spoons I was asking, these things have been out of stock for like six weeks, what is going on? And the company that makes spoons also makes uh, pump heads, so that's why. So aquarium co spoon, no go. But we did launch some new products. If you've been following us on Facebook and uh, the old YouTube community page, we do have some new things. One of them would be this right here, this metal gang valve. We tried so long to get some plastic ones or at least keep them in stock and that was a no-go so we have now gone with the metal ones and I want to say these are like six bucks something like that and I will warn you and I say warn just because I know we're gonna customer service things there is some gunk on the outside of them sometimes I don't see any now because I fidgeted with these I sat here for basically six weeks doing this and trying to break them and playing with them and making sure they're really going to hold up because usually you set it like once and you let it sit for like 10 years but I really wanted to make sure that it could take the abuse right but there it comes with a little bit of uh, for lack of a better term lube or grease there and so they grease each joint when they put it together and as you play with it you can get a little bit coming out but it doesn't go in the aquarium it stays outside but that's what you would see like hey there's some gunk on here it's kind of like when you get sometimes you'll get some uh, uh, nuts and bolts and stuff like that and you got to put some together and they're greasy it's so they don't rust and they stay free and movable so that's one of the items that we uh, we do have now available the other one which I'm very excited about I kind of always this is an item where maybe a few years ago I'd be like wow it'd be super cool if we ever got to the point where we would carry that that seems like a huge like investment capital wise and it was but we finally been able to bring in linear air piston pumps now I only brought in one size because I really analyzed I own so let me back let me show you what it is first of all this is a linear piston air pump it is a air pump that puts out a ton of air but is super quiet so think of it like our USB nano air pump on steroids like this thing will do 47 liters per minute which you're a home aquarist just like me so you have no idea what that means but this runs my entire fish room this runs uh, Dean's entire fish room runs Zenzo's fish room runs Randy's fish room all those fish rooms are run by this pump now what what did, why did I only choose this pump because most people I know buy this pump it's 230 bucks right and it'll run a ton of stuff now let me set that off to the side it's getting heavy 
They make bigger ones. I use a couple of bigger ones at the store. I've got a couple, well, I've got one bigger one sitting in my garage that I don't use when I downgraded. So if, you're, if you've been around for a while, the fish room used to be more like 70 to 100 air stone drops. Uh, and now it's much less. So that bigger air pump is sitting off to the side. What's really good about these linear air piston pumps is they can work together. So let's say you've got 40 aquariums and you're running one of these and you go, I'm going to double it. I'm going to run 80 aquariums. You can just plug another one in and hook it into your air loop that's going around the fish room. And because it's a piston in there moving, they just work together. They don't fight against each other. Like if you put normal air pumps, connect them to each other, the diaphragms fight to push air. So if you take two air pumps, you try to push them to one point, they're just fighting against each other and some will go, but it's not, it doesn't work in tandem like this one would. So, uh, yeah, we're excited. We brought in, you know, a whole pallet of these things and as you can see expensive at 230 bucks a piece. They're price competitive. What I mean by that is our price is probably the most expensive you're going to see online, but we have free shipping and we're going to ship a priority. Whereas some of our competitors, I don't want to name them because I don't want to disparage them at all. Uh, not so much that I'm afraid you go there because I've shopped there and that kind of stuff, but I don't want to put them under the bus. They'll advertise it for maybe 200 bucks, but then when you go to ship it, all of a sudden it's kind of snail mail and 30 bucks anyway. So that's why ours on the surface, a lot of people are like, is this the same one? You're 30 bucks more expensive. Yes, but we're, we just rather roll all the shipping uh, kind of into that. You know, and so in an item that's at 230 bucks, you already qualify for free shipping. You're going to get our free things that we throw in from time to time. Depending on what order it is, you might get, you know, a free sticker or something like that. And, uh, you know, and you get the aquarium co-op guarantee, which the aquarium co-op guarantee doesn't really guarantee anything other than if we read the transaction, we're like, wow, that thing should not have had that happen. Then we take care of you. That's, you know, and that's, that's open to a lot of interpretation. Like I did break one of these myself, uh, which sucked. And actually it was a different, it was a slightly bigger one. And it was for my pond and we had a huge, horrible rainstorm. And I thought, well, I gotta put it outside and I'll put it on some wood blocks. So that way if it ever rains, and I put a, I put a, like a recycling bin over it. So no rain could get on this, it was fine. And then it was up off the ground by about six inches. That was good. And then it rained so hard the one time our warehouse flooded. And then on top of that, uh, it made the, the wood blocks float. So it floated, fell over and totally shorted out. So now I got it. That's why I have this one here right now is I got to go install that on my, my pond. And now I'm going to build like a shelf and a cover and, you know, make it several feet off the ground. So, you know, you don't plan ahead that, Oh, there's going to be over six inches of standing water in this thing eventually if it's a horrible torrential downpour. So, uh, the other thing this does come with is the little elbow here. And so you'd put that elbow on the end and connect it to PVC pipe. You can go, I recommend adapting it up to one inch. You can go as small as half an inch, but the bigger the pipe you have, the better it's gonna be on your overall system. So that's, that's the second new item we had come in. All right, but now that you've finished admiring my haircut, or my lack of haircut, my hair, let's go ahead and talk about the mini ponds, because that's what I wanna talk about today. And full disclosure, it wasn't till about what time? It's 4.08 right now. It wasn't until about uh, 2.40 that I kind of really logged into YouTube and I saw, oh, Steen Fought Aquatics did a live stream about basically the same topic this morning. So I'm sure all the YouTube uh, back channel people will be like, look at this guy, he's totally copying. That would be true, except uh, Irene, who makes a lot of these topics up for us, had already had this in the pipeline and I just couldn't get the stupid topic. It wouldn't let me make it go live, so I had to make a new one, so. All right, let's talk about ponds. So I'm into ponds, and I think it's the perfect time for you guys to get into ponds because a lot of you, like me, are kind of stuck at home. You might be able to go out, you might be able to have a little bit of social interaction, but for the most part, I think most of us, well, we should be staying home. And I think, you know, depending on what your state allows, you might be able to make that Home Depot trip, you might be able to order from us, uh, and get the supplies you need to start working with it. So the first thing you need, and that's gonna be, I think the only thing I don't have sitting here to show you guys, is a container. 
Now it can be something as small as like a little whiskey barrel. It could be, um, you know, a Walmart pool. You know, those things are like 80 bucks and now they're 10 feet wide and, and uh, your neighbors will hate you because it looks bad, that. Uh, or you can get like Rubbermaid totes or things like I have in my fish room. The Rubbermaid totes, I get them from farm stores basically, like co-ops, and they run a loose amount, about a dollar a gallon. So $100 gets you about a 100 gallon tote. And there's a little bit of leeway in there. Maybe you got to pay 80 bucks, you get the 100 tote. And depending on brand, if you buy an off brand, sometimes you can get like, I got the 150 gallon for only 100 bucks, but Rubbermaid, that one is like 150 bucks. So you get yourself some kind of rigid thing, I think. You could definitely dig a hole and put a liner in, but I'm too lazy for that. And I think the one of the biggest lures for the mini pond setup is us that rent. And I don't rent anymore, but I did for a very long time. And because it was above ground, you could kind of drag it out and use it, put it away if you want. You can have it on a deck. You can have it in an apartment up above, assuming that, you know, you don't put something way too big in there. But it's, I think that's the lure of it is it's not permanent. So you can get it past your significant other when they think you're extra crazy and they said no more tanks in the house. You go, oh, don't worry. It's not in the house. We got it outside. And so you drag one of those things home and about, I will say the hundred gallon tote uh, by Rubbermaid typically can fit in the back of like a uh, Toyota Camry or like a, a Volkswagen Jetta, kind of that family sedan. Ask me how I know because that's all I had for a very long time. So definitely when you're buying it, kind of bring that up like, I'm buying this if we can wedge this into the back of my car because otherwise they're hard to move. You got to have a van or a truck or something like that. So that might limit you as well. But in general, buy the biggest one you can get. I, I would rather have one big one than five small ones. If you're really in a pinch, you can, you know, I was going to say run to Kmart, but they don't really exist anymore. Run to like a Target or a Walmart or something like that and get those like blue totes that are like this big around with some rope handles. And those are about 17 gallons usually. And that in a pinch will get you through a summer or two. And I say a summer or two because the plastic that's used there is pretty chintzy. And yeah, that thing might run you 10, 12 bucks. But after a season or two of the sun beating down on it, you're going to go to move it and it's just going to snap on you or something. So it's not a, a long-term thing where like the Rubbermaid totes, I've had some of those running for almost 10 years now. And they're, for the most part, the exact same as when I bought them. They're real thick, heavy plastic. So um, yeah, go with what you can get. So finding the container, that's the part I can't really sell you. If you live super rural, you might not be able to get it, but you can always dig a hole in the ground. You can, you can, uh, you know, look on Pinterest and all of that and find people to get, oh, I had a tractor tire. Then I laid a tarp in it. Now I got this rad pond. You could be cooler than me. I'm not that cool. Uh, but let's say you've got something water's going to go into. And by the way, you can use aquariums. I've done that many times. Not my favorite, by the way, uh, but I've done 75 gallon, done 55 gallon. I've done 10 and 20 gallons outside. And part of the problem is I'm going to tell you why I don't like them. First, algae really grows on the side. And so the whole point of a glass tank is like, I'm going to look at these things. They're going to be cool. You don't really get that aspect. Two, you just look like that guy on the street where their yard is terrible and the neighbors are like, what are they doing over there? They're bringing down the property value. Somehow it just never looks good. And three, the one that you really don't want is you're going to be mowing your lawn and you're going to send a rock winging across the yard and it's going to smash that aquarium. It happens. So when you have these totes, it bounces right off. No one worries about it. But, you know, you've been mowing your lawn before and you've had a rock go and hit your car. and You're like, whoo, yeah. But imagine now you've got an aquarium sitting on the ground, you know, and that glass is not that thick. So that's why I don't recommend. You can use it in a pinch and I have done it, but you know, maybe try and dress it up a little bit, maybe surround it with some bamboo or plants or rocks, whatever you're going to do. All right. So now that you've got a container, the filtration, I think, is kind of the next thought that I would go into. And I've seen people take this way too far. I've seen people not do anything. I'm somewhere in between. And that would be, I like a sponge filter, big shocker, right? But a lot of people go, well, I'm going to put a sump on it. I'm going to put a fountain on it. I'm going to put this pump in there. I'm going to connect three of them. They're going to make it do all these things. And what happens is it does all of those things, but it also tends to be either too much current or 
it's sucking up fry and you're defeating the purpose of like maybe breeding for profit or is making some babies. And that's one of the biggest use cases I like is making fish outside. So I recommend just a sponge filter and it lends itself towards being able to get fry going. Maybe you get Daphnia going outside. Maybe you just want mosquitoes. Doesn't matter what you want. Like it, it just works for everything. And so I like to go with just a standard sponge filter. I've used all different kinds over the years. I mean, I'm partial to mine, obviously, but uh, I like this size. So this is not the biggest one we sell. This is the one step down. This is my favorite. And because you can have a huge, huge pond, you don't need radical circulation and stuff though. You just need the oxygen coming from it. You want a little bit of biological going on. And really you want this huge weighted base so it goes down into the, into the, the pond and you could say like, well, couldn't you just use an air stone? Well, yes, you could technically, and I do recommend running one of those in here, but in my experience, and this is, this is 10 plus years of doing this, by the way, in my experience, there's gonna be two or three times over the summer that a raccoon or some animal is gonna come, take a drink out of that pond, start playing with it, and they're gonna pull on the hose and they pull out air stones. The sponge filter, which I've seen them take that out too, not nearly as much, but the heavier that is, the more likely that is to stay in there. And yes, I have seen raccoons take bites out of these things and leave them for you the next day. They don't like the taste, which is nice, but. So I recommend just that sponge filter it works out really nicely and it's easier to run, you know, maybe a little solar power air pump. If you want to buy one of those, get a little bit of power going than getting an extension cord with a big pump running and it doesn't use much energy also and something like this you know an air setup is going to cost you about 20 bucks to get going whereas you know a fountain and all that you you run to home depot pretty soon you're spending 70 bucks on something that probably only cost you 25 on amazon it's going to clog up and that's when you start moving that water through there really quickly it's going to collect everything which is great you know it's going to collect your fry it's going to collect your shrimp and shred those to death but it's also going to collect any algae or anything like that and the water's going to look pretty good for a while and then it's going to bind up and you're going to clean in that thing like every two or three weeks and so that's not fun for me i like it just to let it be kind of au natural let bugs come in i want bees to come in and land on lily pads and take a drink and do all of that and so that's my mo there so that is how I would filter it. Now, obviously you gotta put some water in there and you're gonna need some dechlorinator. I like Fritz dechlorinator because it's got a pump head on it. You can use Ultimate, you can use Prime. That one doesn't really matter at all. Uh, and in fact, if you only have chlorine, you could just put some water in there, let it sit for a few days, and then do something. Because a lot of what we're gonna do is when we go to set this pond up, you put water in it and you just let it sit for a while, let leaves fall in, let bugs start going. Uh, for me, I usually like to see one of a couple signs. Either A, algae growing around the outside, B, green water, or C, mosquito larva. If one of those is going on in there, then I know it's ready to really put some fish in. And usually by the time those things happen, we're getting lots of algae and all of that. Usually we're getting a lot of sunlight, which usually means we got a little bit of warmer temperature, which is nice. Uh, if we're getting mosquitoes and all of that, that's just a ton of food ready to go. That means you don't have to put any food in. That's nice. Uh, and if you don't do anything for too long, you're going to get a mosquito problem and that's not good for you or your neighbors. And so, but you could, I do harvest and then I go feed uh, in my fish room. In fact, right now I have a makeshift unintentional pond and that is a wheelbarrow that got set out from when my wife was moving some bricks and it collected some water and I watched some mosquitoes starting to breed in it. And I was like, yes, we're going to get mosquitoes going here because all my other ponds have uh, fish in them. So, uh, yeah, I'll be collecting and feeding mosquitoes. So don't be too afraid of those. As long as you collect them all the time, it's not a nuisance to your family or your neighbors or anything like that. So I actually have a prop when it comes to green water. I brought green water in. This, I'm actually growing this inside. I'm super proud of my green water. This is inside right now. I am super proud of my green water. Corey, how do you get such good green water? Well, let me tell you. Uh, I, one, I use a lot of light, so I bought a crazy like light up your whole garage type light and it's over my pond right now. Two, I got green water started outside because sunlight's super duper powerful. Um, and three, I feed it a lot of easy green. 
So the way I normally start my ponds, I get that dechlorinator in there, something's bubbling, and then I take it and I, I literally just do this. I just keep going like, I do that a bunch. I don't care how much nitrate's going in there. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, you, I've, I've had times where I pour a whole bottle in before and the goal is let that water turn super green and let it start just crunching that night or that, uh, yeah, the nitrogen down and consuming it. And then, you know, when you put fish in there, like you can put as much food as you want in there. It doesn't matter. Like they're just, it's going to crush it. So that's how I start. I mean, I do the same, normally I do the same thing. It's just like squirt, 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 squirt with dechlorinator and then squirt, 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 squirt with easy green. And then, um, yeah, that's my move. Now, if you're doing Daphne or something like that, you wouldn't want to use a ton of dechlorinator. And I don't even recommend using a ton of easy green for that specific tangent setup we're going to talk about real quick. Uh, just grab a handful of grass, like just grab your grass and throw it in there. And uh, that's going to start a bacterial bloom and uh, ammonia. And then that sunlight's going to beat down on it and turn it green just like this. And then those Daphne are going to consume it and you're going to have a, a Daphnia farm going. So, you know, just be aware of that corner case scenario. Now, if you've done it right, in my opinion, if you've done it right, you've got this green water everywhere. And then maybe you've got some lily pads on the top or some water lettuce or some kind of floating plant, something that looks pretty from up above, right? So you've got the cover and what I, okay, I guess to explain why do I really like green water? So one, it's always cleaning for you. So this green water is the same as like having tons of live plants in your tank. It's consuming waste for you all the time. It also, because you can't see me through this, right? It provides cover. So the fry can kind of swim around by the cover of night or the cover of easy green water, right? So they, they fly, they fly around, they, they swim around in that and they don't get uh, as much predation from anything really. I was gonna say just the parents, but this also helps like in a koi pond and that kind of stuff. It'll help herons not spot the koi. It'll help raccoons and other predators from spotting whatever fish you got in there. And if you got little guppies, you don't want cats. Like cats have been a problem for me. Raccoons have been a problem. And so the less they can see, the better. And so that will, in, I, in my experience, it like quadruples the yield. So if you had clean water and you get 100 guppies, by just having green water, you might get 400, you did the same amount of work, same amount of food, all of that. And I should, I forgot about that. This is also a very uh, fine first food. So if you were spawning like rainbow fish or something that's gonna be super duper tiny outside, this green water is actually their first food. So it's kind of nice to have around. All right, so you've got green water, you got the cover, you got the plants, you've got all that going on. Now you gotta select some fish. There's kind of two camps. There is the, maybe you can keep them out year round. Like in Washington, we have mild winters and stuff, so there's some fish we can do. Maybe you're in the right part of California and you can do all kinds of fish year round all the time. Maybe you're gonna set up a little greenhouse over it, but you gotta use a little bit of your noodle there and go, okay. What is my winter gonna be like? What's my game plan? And you start planning on, is this more of a, uh, is this a three month project? We're, we're getting started early now, so it might be more like a four to six month project. Or is this a year round thing that's gonna stay up all the time? And so I typically only shoot for year round stuff because I like to do this every year. But if you're new to it, maybe you wanna just go, well, let's see if, you know, my, my girlfriend, my husband, whoever will tolerate it for more than three months. And so I'm going to go with something that hopefully will breed, raise up, will experience all that. And then I'll either bring them inside to my home or I will give them to a pet store or sell them, whatever I'm going to do. And so great starter fish. If you don't know what you're doing at all, white clouds, especially gold white clouds, gold white clouds in green water, or just when the sunlight hits them looks amazing. So a nice, uh, golden white cloud. Uh, long fin normal white clouds are super cool. Normal white clouds are super cool also. I used to always do uh, the great white cloud race. And that was everyone started between you were allowed to buy up to 12 white clouds. And you could have bought feeders or you could buy long fin or whatever you want. And then at the end of the season, uh, the person who bred the most caught them, counted them, and then submitted a picture would win prizes. And that was always super fun and it was easy. And it was a lot of times the first time people had ever bred fish. A lot of times a family would get involved and it was cool, right? And so 
very easy. The other ones that would be easy but not cheap would be things like uh, rice fish, great fish to do it with. Florida flag fish would be a good one. Uh, guppies are good but not when it gets too cold. Variatus platys are great. Sword tails. A lot of live bears are really easy. It, I've had some people try and do like uh, bristle nose and that kind of stuff outside and it can be done. The problem is you know, you got to put them out there already adult size. And so if they're already spawning, then you get like maybe two or three spawns. But after three months, the babies are only like that big anyway. And so I feel like you don't get as much benefit out of doing something like that. But definitely if you, you know, if you're five pawns in and you want to try some stuff, there's people I know in California that will breed um, paradise fish, garamis. Uh, they'll also do uh, Piscogramma borelli. You know, there's different cichlids you can do outside. Really, the sky's the limit. You just have to devise a plan. And the more times you do it, the better you're going to get. And you go, wow, didn't expect that to happen this year. Okay, next year I'm going to be ready for that. I'll have a heater going or I'll build a little greenhouse or I've got this tank that I'm going to move into in my garage or whatever. Or, or at this point, you might have already been growing those bristlenose out for six, eight months. And now they're going to go out. And so you're ready for that next year. And so pick a fish that, one, you wouldn't be sad to have a bunch of at the end of the, the season. But then I, I do recommend picking a fish that you are likely to have a bunch. Because if you just put six things into a pond and you come back four months later and you just have six things left, not very fun. So someone's asking Celestia Pearl Danios. I've always thought they'd be a great one, but I've never tried it. And because I wanted to make sure I was successful. So I always do live bears and shrimp and rice fish and that kind of stuff. But it, it does, it seems like it should work. Um, and I mean, I know other people have done it, but there's, for me at the end, if I have a hundred gallon pond, if I don't pull like two, three, 400 fish out of there, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I made 10. That was all right. I want a lot. Cause when you have, for me, I want to take six of something. And at the end, I want to put them into a 55 and be like, there's 300 of those. That looks so cool. I could have never afforded to do that otherwise, right? And so maybe that's a battle plan. I hadn't thought of that until right now. But maybe what we do with Ladybird, so we've got still got the baby goldfish in here that I need to catch, and I want to film a little video on them because they're growing like weeds. Uh, but once we put the background in, we get Ladybird moved, maybe the goal will be what do we put out and try and breed and then bring into... Uh, this pond after quarantine of course at the end of the season that might be a cool fun thing to do because I don't want to buy oh, I had to buy 500 of these cost me a thousand dollars like that doesn't sound fun at all but if I bought six and then we brought in 500 of those things that sounds like a you know a fun thing like I made those there's always that pride of uh, doing it like that so yeah I might think if there's something I could breed in there another one I can think of would be a really good one uh, rosy barbs especially longfin rosy barbs look super cool I might do ooh, long fin rosy barbs look awesome. If you've ever seen adult, like four or five year old long fin rosy barbs, they are so cool. But I mean, the males are, the females are a little bit eh, but the males super cool. So then it comes to feeding. So we already established you got some green water, you got some bugs, you probably got, um, you know, bugs kind of falling in and dying. You've got ants getting their way in there. You've got uh, mosquito larvae. You might have a little bit of worms or um, uh, what am I trying to think of? Like daphnia and seed pods, or not, seed shrimp, that kind of stuff that kind of get going in there. So you're going to have all these live natural sources feeding your fish. And so I focus on once a day feeding is pretty much. Now, if you got frozen foods, they're always great. And I try to rotate that in. But a lot of times... I'm super lazy and so I keep my food and everything kind of close to the pond and I've definitely done whole years where I only feed fry food at the time when I was developing fry food it was just food that I mixed up and fed out of a squeeze bottle and uh, the, one of the reasons I, I do fry food and you can see I've fed like a lot of this fry food uh, is because the babies are the ones that need to eat when a bug falls in the adult fish can usually eat that or the mosquito larva, that kind of stuff. But those babies, they don't have a whole lot of food. And so I always feed tons of small foods. Uh, the other ones that I do is typically always a small granule. This year so far, I've been doing uh, the nano, extreme nano bites. So, or not nano bites, but just the extreme nano uh, little pellets. And then also crushing up flakes. I, I pretty much just grab, these kind of all live by the ponds and I grab them and I put some food in. And the nice thing is, is I can feed pretty heavy and not worry about it because all that green water will just consume anything they don't eat. 
And so I rotate between those and if I'm really like spend a lot of time outside and I really want to treat them, I'll go inside and get frozen uh, baby brine or cyclops. Yeah, is that? Oh, I, I guess I want to touch on uh, water changes. So when it comes to water changes, typically I almost never change water, usually about once a year. And sometimes what I'll do is I will put, um, like with this pond that you get, I'll drill a hole towards the top, like maybe an inch or two down. And so that when it rains really hard, little bits of water will come out and it won't just be like, oh, it's gonna overflow off the edge. And so, cause I don't want the water level that high and just like that guppy just going, oh, let me jump, yoink. And so I want the, the top of the water to always stay down a bit. And so that little hole will allow that to happen usually. Uh, and so water is usually my water changes. Now, if you live somewhere where you're getting no rain at all, you might have evaporation issues, topping off, that kind of stuff. But in terms of changing water, because of the green water consuming everything, I find that most times you can get through a whole growing season out of a problem. When you come out of that growing season, that's when, you know, it's okay, it's the next year, maybe it's right now and you had this pond set up since last year. You might go out there, clean the sponge filter, do a 50% water change, kind of just take a look in this thing and just see like how many pine cones are in the bottom, how many leaves are down there, what is going on with this thing, maybe clean out some of that gunk, maybe you don't and then go for the season again. So not a lot of water changes at all. And in fact, I find too many water changes to be detrimental. You're interrupting, you're cooling the water down too much, you're doing all of these things. I prefer to just kind of set it and forget it, let nature do its thing. That's one of my favorite parts is watching, um, you know, watching newts get into it, watching the bees come and take a drink, watching a bird. I mean, so I'm, I'm big on the, I do this outside for the challenge. And so, I definitely have crows and stuff like that that will come and eat a guppy and I'm kind of okay with it. If I'm making 500 guppies and I only need like 100, what, who am I to say that a crow can't eat seven of them over the course of a summer? Now, if it's, you only got six and he's eating them right away, like that's a problem. But you know, when you start getting a lot of them, it's kind of survival of the fittest. Green water, they learn to swim down and it only, you know, I've never had them like wipe it out or anything like that. But I have seen them like, oh my gosh, I think that thing just ate a guppy or whatever type of fish is in there. So um, usually with small fish, you wouldn't have herons uh, with, and usually you don't have problems with uh, raccoons with small fish, but cats will try and get some stuff every once in a while. And so, you know, I would, you can put kind of chicken wire on top, anything that is a reasonable top, you can put glass, that'll make the water heat, heat up. You can, you know, put anything you want. <coughs> I just realized I haven't taken a drink and I've been talking for like 30 minutes straight. You can do a net, you can do anything to, you know, a moderate barrier. And that's one of the reasons why I like to drill that hole down below. If your water level is all the way at the top, then you put a net over it. The cat or whatever just goes like, oh, you can see here, here's the net. I'll just grab it right through it, right? So you want some separation between whatever top you put and the uh the barrier if you will and you can diy tell your your heart's content there there's so many options but you know and and we've done some i've done when i used to give presentations on this topic i showed some of the ones we did with the 300 gallon ponds and some of the best ones we ever did was making um we would go on craigslist and stuff and get like old shower doors or sliding shower doors so you could like put this thing over the pond keep it open during the summer and then close it up when it was starting to get cold. So that way the sunlight would come in, heat up the water, stay warm. You basically make a greenhouse out of it. So you sometimes you can find windows or uh, skylights or um, bathroom doors, I guess. You know, the, the glass ones to really make something pretty big. But it looks ghetto unless you spend a lot of time really making it look like it's supposed to be that way. If you just lay a giant thing on there, like... Why is there that storm door in the middle of your yard? Oh, I'm keeping out the raccoons. Like that doesn't look nearly as cool as like, oh wow, you found a perfect window that fits this thing. And then you go to Home Depot and you get that like those bamboo reeds, right? That like unrolls and you could like, oh, I wrapped it in that. I made it look pretty good. So, you know, you definitely, once you get a little success under your belt, you want to dress it up a little bit because it's going to be around for a while. All right. I know we've had some super chats and all kinds of stuff come through here. Oh, I do want to point out that in the chat at the top, we do have a link for shirts. There are four new ones. We have, uh, well, 
there's a shirt of this Cardinal Tetra. That's on there. There is a shirt of this uh, Angelfish. There's not one of Murphy. There's one of a Discus, and there is one of a, uh, a Beta or a Beta. So, and if you're a member of the channel, by the way, there is a discount code on the member section of the community page to get five bucks off. So if you become a member today and you want one of those shirts, you could hop onto the community page and go, oh, I can save five dollars on a shirt. So it's basically like, oh, you're buying a shirt, you get a free membership for at least a month, right? So not bad. All right, let's let's dive into some of these questions and super chats and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, I think that was a good start to the show. I like that one. I'm going to check that in the, that felt good column. Is using highlight dumb without CO2? Uh, yes. I would say so. At the very high levels, most people are using way more light than they need to, myself included. So when we go to high levels, like actual high levels, that's where we've actually gone very far. So I think... Yeah, at those high levels, using CO2 makes your job easier. It's not required, but it does make it easier. Uh, let's see. Joel G with a $2 super chat. Thank you. QT Summer Tub Fun. Taco cold here still. Oh, too cold. <laughs> Someone might want tacos. Too cold, not taco cold. All right. Uh, author Nancy gave 20 bucks, thanks, to us and the Coop family, making quarantine bearable since 2020. That's my campaign slogan. I'm going to run on something on. I don't know what I'm running for yet, but if I do. New member from uh, Laura Lee Bond, Manic Fish Keeper, started on my guppy journey, 14 guppies now, and I have 150, and I've sold 300. Thank you, Corey, for the inspirational videos. Nice. That's a solid, I mean, even if you only sold them at a buck a piece, let's say you bought guppies at five bucks a piece, you bought 14 of them, you're into it for, what is that, 55 bucks? Is that right? No. 12, that'd be, no, that's 70 bucks. You're into it for 70 bucks, you've now sold 300 of them, you made 300 bucks, even if you've only sold them for a dollar a piece, you're looking good. That's a fun hobby. Victor is a new member, thank you. All right, great subject for pawns. I've got one female and I had 79 fry today and is up to, wait, and the other is up to 32 with two more popping and I didn't count that yet. Nice. One thing, one fact I like to bring up is we're pretty much never going to break the uh, biggest birth records that are set like for the American Library Association because we used to always breed fish separately. So we take males and females, we'd separate them, grow them for months, get them super fat and sassy, put them together and we'd get these spawns of I think the record's like 391 or something like that from one female guppy. Uh, I hope there's a day and age when we come back to that because that just seems super cool. The fish were a lot bigger back then and pretty robust too. That's a cool side fact. Oh, and Yoeli Rosenberg. Yoeli? Yo, yo, Yoeli? Yoeli? I don't know. Hopefully I got one of those right. Became a member. And SC Aquatics, 25 easy feeders to set up. Whoa. Yes, we do still have some easy feeders. I, I will say this because I, I see people mention it all the time. We had a meeting on Tuesday and a portion of time was spent to what can we do about these easy feeders? Do we need to switch brands? Do, can we get them to fix it? Do we need to get someone else to test? Do we just sell them and let you guys buy them and just warranty them like we would normally do? Like the demand, the problem we have right now is demand is super high. Supply is super low. There's a gap in the market. Ours are really good if they're not DOA out of the box. And when they are DOA out of the box, we just look bad. So how do we figure out where brand new customer never ordered from Aquarium Co-op before orders from us. It's got the great box and oh, look at this. It's, you know, Aquarium Co-op. Oh, it doesn't work. Like we don't want to, we don't want them to think like, oh yeah, this company is peddling crap. No, but long term we do want to get it fixed at the same time. We gotta figure out what it is that's wrong. And two, if we need to upgrade that part, does that impact pricing? Like, you know, if all of a sudden it's double, cause like that manufacturer makes a full digital one, but we have to sell that thing for like $65. Like that's way different than a $20 auto feeder. So we definitely had discussions about it. We're, we're still looking into it. I mean, I say looking into it. There's not a lot we can actually do while we're waiting on the company to do something, but 
it's definitely high in our minds because it's it's sitting there in the warehouse. We got you know half a pallet of them, and people order them. And there's a super secret way to order them where you have to contact us, the company. We give you a secret link, and you have to agree that you know that yes, five percent of them are kind of DOA out of the box, and if there is one DOA, we'll send you a replacement one on your next order. Like we don't want to just send it out right away. So there's like all these little intricacies about it. But like this person bought 25 of them. I'm using them in the fish room a ton. The people like our employees, like we love them, but they almost need that. Like, well, it's almost like I kind of like having a secret menu item. That's what I call it at the warehouse, the secret menu item. Chad Krotz says, you touched briefly on pond overfill due to rain. Anything you can, anything more you can unpack on that subject? Uh, I don't worry about pH changing from the rain that much. Um, I, I like the natural water change of it. It can change water temperature a little bit, but, you know, I think it's more of a problem in very, very hard water states, which, luckily, well, I shouldn't say luckily, we don't have that going on here, so I don't have to worry about it. But in general, I view... Uh, rain is a positive thing for the, uh, the, 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 I would say the barrels of the ponds or the totes, whatever you want to call it. Um, I mean, I guess in extreme situations like, oh my God, it rained seven inches this week. Like maybe you better check water parameters. Like you should check water parameters anyway, but I don't think there's a whole lot other than don't let it overflow your fish. And, uh, yeah, I think that's because like with normal ponds, you don't do a whole lot for it, but. Obviously, seven inches of water in 100 gallons is way different than seven inches of water in 5,000 gallons. My weather goes up to 120 degrees in the summer and 40 to 50 in the winter. It's all over the place. Would a pond be viable? Uh, Henry, I think you could do one. And so it gets crazy hot in, let's say, Peru, and it gets pretty cold in Peru. Part of it is finding a way to insulate from temperature swings. So if you put it in the ground, that inherently keeps a pond cooler, but also warmer. So it keeps it closer to earth core temp, and so it'll be less swings. The larger the pond, so a 300-gallon pond is going to fare a lot better for you than a 17-gallon pond. And so you can start stacking the odds in your favor. So maybe you go, okay, I go with a bigger pond. I put it in the ground. That helps me insulate a little bit. I run extra aeration because evaporative cooling helps cool water. That's a good thing, right? And then you go, oh, but I get cold at some part of the year. Oh, and maybe you cover it up, right? Maybe you put like a, a layer of, of bubble wrap over the top of this thing, let some sunlight in, traps a lot of the heat, and you get your way through by running some white clouds or something like that. Like you just have to put a little more of a thinking cap on and go, all right, I got a few stages to this. And I, by the way, I would really enjoy that because um, the more factors you add in, the more I'm like, ooh, what can I design to combat that? That sounds fun. And so I, I would look at it like you just get to do an advanced course in these little ponds. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab some normal chat stuff for a bit, and then I'll grab some more super chat stuff. So hold your horses. All right. Someone says, just sell the auto feeders. People won't care. There's always people that care, and and we care. That the other thing, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I there's a lot of things where I know, like, well, we know our competitors would do that, but that doesn't mean I sleep at night, right? Like, there's like that's not right, and I I think if we can find the exact right needle, or th thread the needle, yeah, thread the needle, of full disclosure, because one of the, one of the things. $20 on that feeder is an amazing price. Like, that's the thing. Like, I feel like, because I, I, I literally told this to Randy. I go, if if I had ordered 20 of these things on, on eBay or Amazon, and so if I ordered 20, what is that? How many, how many DOA would I have? My brain is, like, breaking down. If you have five out of 100, we're going to have one. We're going to have one DOA, right? If I ordered 20 of these on, on Amazon, and they weren't aquarium co-op, like I just ordered them some random brand, and I had 19 out of 20 of them working well, I would be too lazy to even get a replacement. I'd be like, wow, these things are amazing. Let me recommend them to all my friends, right? But I'm just hypercritical of my own brand and everything, and so it like holds me back a bit. And they do seem to go a little bit in batches, because I, I actually, I, I suspect that there's probably, let's say there's 10 individuals doing the circuitry on these things, right? Or whatever the part's going wrong. 
one solders a little differently, one goes, oh, I installed it a little bit off or something. And that guy might have done 50 of those that day, right? And all of his are slightly off. And so you get these runs of like, oh my gosh, that guy got four bad ones. And then, oh, that guy ordered 80 of them, didn't have a single problem, you know? And so I think that's the fear is like, oh, geez, I just got three that don't work. We look terrible now. I got to get over that. Or I don't know if I got to get over that. Hopefully I can fix it first. But the goal originally was let's get it fixed. Boom. And won't be a problem. Now it's been like six or eight months and uh, we haven't done anything because of all of this stuff. So it's like, well, now the, the landscape's changing a little bit of like, okay, people are getting restless. There's going to be a ride in the streets for these aquarium co-op feeders. All right. You just need a filter? Yeah, a little sponge filter will do you good in your, in your ponds. The other good thing is you can seed extra sponge filters out in a pond. If you need a quarantine tank inside, go grab a sponge filter. Vice versa, you can have extra sponge filters inside. Ooh, it's pond season. Let me kick them out and get some going outside too. All right, I'm scrolling on multiple chats here. I want to try two Jaguar cichlids in my pond. How do I tell the difference between male and female in yearlings, not fry? Typically on the females, you're going to see more of that purple color coming out. Now, by no means am I a Central and South American cichlid expert, but in general, females are more aggressive and they develop that purple color without venting them. I'm not sure. I can't think of other telltale signs off the top of my head that would lead me towards male and female. Ideally, you'd see a little bit of like pairing behavior going on. By the way, we had Gopode Mel reach out to us about some specific filter stuff. He was the one that had uh, 600 gallon and 400 gallon aquariums with Jaguars and Dovi and that kind of stuff. And I asked him if I could ever do a follow-up because that was one of the first tours I did way back in the day. And he said, yeah, once everything kind of clears up, we should do another one. And now my equipment's better and, and all of that. So I'm excited to see, you know, I, I, am, I, I don't imagine his hobby has changed a whole lot, but his tanks are like, this, I mean, this is 800 gallons, but, oh, he's got a 1,000. He's got a 1,000 gallon, two 600 gallons, and like a few 400 gallons. So pretty much he's got, his fish room is only the tanks this size, and he does crazy fish that people don't do a lot. So I'm excited to go back there, hopefully, in the next three to six months. Do I ever medicate in the ponds for new fish? I personally don't. So my, my logic is a lot of times I'm buying from my own store, so they're already healthy. But most times if I was ordering on Aquabid or, you know, maybe let's say let's, let's use, let's use our affiliate link. <laughs> That's smart. Let's say we're going to order some stuff in from Aquahuna, right? Personally, whenever I order fish in, it always, well, I shouldn't say always, 99% of the time goes into a home aquarium, like in the fish room. Cause I want to see like, are they healthy? And then I would put meds in there. So I give them like a, a brief trio let them sit there for like a week, let them acclimate, make sure they're doing well. Then we'll kick them outside. When stuff comes back in, <clears throat> people ask all the time, like, do you think we have to, like, what about bird parasites and all that? I think it's not highly likely, but if I was going to sell a bunch to a store and they don't quarantine, maybe I would. Want to go to Ladybird? I've got too much to lose, so I will. But in general, if it was my own personal, like let's say I'm bringing 300 of those white clouds in, I'm putting them in a 55-gallon, I would just bring them in and observe them. If they look great, don't need to medicate. If uh, they start falling apart, oh, bring out the medicine cabinet. Let's, let's get on this. So, But I, I, do, <clears throat> I do recommend treating one of the two, either on the way in or on the way out. I wouldn't I, – I don't let stuff – let me make sure that's a true statement. Yeah, that's true. I don't let stuff into my fish room – that doesn't get medicated. Same with my fish store. Like, cause once you go, ah, they look good. Ah, ee, ah, you know, pretty soon you're just, you're never quarantining and stuff's running rampant and all that. So it's gotta, I believe it's an all or nothing thing. And so, you know, and be diligent about it. Don't be like, oh, I think I'm going to do it. Oh, I didn't do it. And then now at the end of the season, now I'm not doing it again. Like you really gotta, I really do like to do it at the beginning indoors if I can. Pros and cons of the can CO2 kit I sell at the store. Uh, pros are super cheap to get started. Cons are doesn't do that large of a tank. Um, that's really all I got. 
well, that's not 100% true. Long, long term, if you knew you were going to keep a, a planet tank for five years straight, buying a, a CO2 regulator and a CO2 cylinder from like a welding shop is going to be cheaper long term. Most people, though, they don't know. And so it's like when someone's buying a camera and they're like, I'm going to buy this really expensive camera. I'm like, you've never owned a camera. Maybe you should make sure you have the patience for photography and shooting videos and doing all this stuff first before you go spend two or $3,000. Most times they do spend that money and then they go, wow, this is hard. And then they have selling it used. And so you can probably find a used CO2 regulator and CO2 cylinder fairly at a discount. And then you could do that if you know there's no chance of getting out of it. But usually that means you've been in the hobby for a while. You got a few planet tanks. You really want to take it to the next level, blah, blah, blah. But in general, yeah, that could be, I think it's a great thing to like test CO2 and then you go, huh, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Like a lot of people in the plant hobby, they go like, they get all these plants. They're doing really well. Then they, I want to do all these plants, all these really high end ones. They do that. And they're like, wow, it's a lot of work. Oh, all these plants that are super common are super common because they're awesome and they're low maintenance. I'm gonna go back to that. And so that's what I I do. I, I like low maintenance plants. Like, oh, what, what have you done to this crinum? Oh, since I put it in that rock in there, nothing. Well, wait, how many root taps? None. Oh, how much cheesy green? None. Have you done anything? No, literally nothing, right? And so like this, I've got uh, a couple more plants over here. Yes, I've done nothing for those, and they're worse for the wear. Like, I should put root tabs, but I, I know i got to pull that substrate back. And so I try to go with things that are minimal. Like, ah, I just got to feed them, you know, some root tabs once a month. Just put some Easy Green in. When I start putting CO2 in, now i got to put Easy Green in daily with dosers or at least dosing a few times a week. And it's not that I don't want to do that, but that makes sense on, like, one or two aquariums. When you start getting 12, 15, 20 aquariums, it doesn't make sense anymore. For my time. I live in southern Alberta. What outside temperature would be the coolest you would trust before bringing them in for the winter? Uh, when water temp gets, basically when water te temp starts hitting about 65, that's the, all right, on my next day off, I'm going to find something to do with those. I'm going to bring them inside or I'm going to, I usually do it in stages. So what I do is, Maybe I bring the first half and I put them in an aquarium. And then I got 100 left out there. Then I'm like, all right, yeah, maybe next weekend I'm going to take some of those to uh, my local fish store get some credit or my local fish club. And then I probably, I probably get 80 out of those 100. Now I got 20 left in there. It's getting pretty cold out. And they just keep evading me. I mean to go get them. And probably I don't. And then I just see if they can overwinter. Now there's some like guppies. If you get super cold, they're not going to overwinter. But... I have found like, wow, look, that's how I found out cherry shrimp will overwinter with ice this thick over their pond and that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I have this weird like lock mentality of like, okay, we started with six, we made 400, we've distributed and kept 480, the last 20, let's do a little bit of experimentation. The ones that make it through will be very hardy. I can breed those next year. And, but I try to do it with minimal numbers. Like I don't want to just leave 500 and be like, oh, that didn't work. I killed 500. That's, that's not what I'm trying to do either. I want some calculated like, ooh, let's, let's try to get better as a hobbyist here. Let's, let's push the limits a little bit. Let's learn. I never want to kill anything without knowing why it died or just like out of negligence. I want it to be like a calculated um, experiment of like, and if it starts going horribly wrong, by the way, I pull out. You know, if it's like, oh, geez, three just died this morning. That's like, okay, you guys got to come in, you know. And, and part of what's kind of nice is the colder the water gets, the easier they are to catch. And a lot of times what you'll get is the water's getting pretty cold, but the sun will come in and it'll be towards the top of the water. All the fish will go up there and you go, oh, here we go. We're going inside, guys. Don't worry about it. And you guys have seen some of my ponds with ice and water and all that kind of stuff when we – rose this last this last time we pulled them in the garage and did some stuff and so there's always kind of learning and i'm big on learning that's why i really love this hobby is there's always more to learn for me just playing with stuff i wonder ooh, could we do that thing Ooh, could that work i don't know and we'll see all right heather cling with a 20 dollars super chat no questions just saying how good your hair looks today Corey. well thank you 
Actually, she says she loves she, right? Yes. She loves the community and it's her first ever live stream. Well, thank you for hanging out. Hopefully you'll be to many more and hang out with other people because that's, that's what I do. Well, that's not true. I'm an introvert. I don't like hanging out with people at all. Uh, I like doing it in moderation, but I would not do this all the time. And so it's a weird thing for me to meet everyone in person. Not we that's not weird. I enjoy it. Like, oh, 48 hours of time. Amazing. Every day. Terrible. So I'm definitely that, yeah, that'd be great to do a couple times a year for 48 hours. After that, like, well, you know, as I was telling my wife, I was like, I wish we lived somewhere where I couldn't see my neighbor. Because every time they're like, hey, neighbor, what you up to? I'm just like, oh, I'm feeding my pond. Yeah. Oh, you got a pond? What you doing with that? I had the same koi pond as last year. Oh, they made it through the winter, did they? Yep, yep, they did. You know, it's that, that little banter. They're just like, oh. And for me, what really kills me is, what am I stepping on? Oh, a cord. Uh, half the time I'm trying to film. <laughs> and I, I, even if you tell them, like, oh, I kind of film a lot, they're, oh, oh, sorry. You know, and they're never, never, uh, what do you want to call it? Malicious about it. They're not trying to be malicious at all. And I don't like people to feel bad on my account, you know, so I just don't even say anything. I was like, oh, let's film now. <laughs> all right, but back to my own idios idiosyncrasies here. Any tips for an apartment dweller who can't keep tanks indoors and the fish would have to overwinter outside? I would go with white clouds because they are bulletproof. Get yourself like a half whiskey barrel or, or something bigger. I mean, I don't know. You know, there's only so many things you can kind of like put on your back and put a coat over it and look like you have a turtle shell as you kind of climb the stairs into your apartment at night. There's only so big you can go before people are going, I done seen that guy bring a thing over. I'm going to tell the landlord. Right, but get something moderate, and then you can do a little bit of trickery on that. Build it a nice, like, you know, maybe then you go buy a, a zip up clear tent or something to put over it for the winter to keep it a little bit warmer. Then maybe you upscale it one more notch. You're like, okay, I can actually leave like my window cracked a little bit and install a strip here and then put the airline tubing through it so I can pump warm air from my house or my apartment into the pond and because we're trapping in the tent it stays a bit warmer and so again it's that game right like how am i going to craft this game no one else got this crazy situation and i say that because i've done all of that before um and that's that's part of when i go oh i got those last 20 left i wonder if i can overwinter them the first year i ever overwintered white clouds i pumped the air from the fish room outside trying to keep them a little warmer and i built tops and then the next year, I was like, well, let me leave one of those tops off. Okay, I did fine. And then I didn't pump any warm air out the following year. So each year, it, there was like more risk, but I had more data to go, well, they made it fine last year. Oh, they made it fine this year. Oh, they made it fine. And now I just know, oh, in our climate, they did great. Don't even worry about it. So, yeah, I, I like to uptake or I like to take on the challenge, if you will. And uh, I, I honestly do like... The opposition of like, oh, I've got these crazy circumstances. Oh, <laughs> well, I will devise a plan. All right. My wife is, uh, I see. My wife is doing the work for Stanley here. Stanley did a super chat, put the question in a regular chat. Uh, I will, I will get to all the super chats, but I'll get to this one since my wife, my wife, you know, she takes precedence here. I wanted to ask, I purchased some blue velvet shrimp from Aquahuna using the affiliate affiliate link. Thank you. How do I go about introducing them to my guppy tank? Well, in a perfect world, you'd have another tank first. You'd put those blue velvets in there. They'd breed like rabbits, and you'd be like, I got 400 of these, Corey. What do I do? Then I would say, oh, you take 30 of those, and you put them in your guppy tank, and you see what your guppies do with them. But you probably don't have that situation, so... I would say hopefully you got a lot of plant cover going on in there. You feed them pretty good, and then you introduce those shrimp, and maybe they go live under underneath a coconut hut or something like that, and you're not going to see them that much until they get comfortable. And so if you keep those guppies overfed, <clears throat> but water conditions really good, they're less likely to want to chase down any of those. Now hopefully they came in at half inch or bigger. If not, growing them out in another aquarium, the larger they are, the more they can fend off that whale female guppy that's coming to snack on them. Uh, but there's always that inherent risk. And, you know, in previous years, I've always said mixing fish is like mixing pets at home. 
you know, a lot of people keep dog and cats together in the same house, and there's dogs and cats that hate each other. And so even if, you know, your neighbor has dogs and cats, they live together, it's fine, and you go and get a dog and a cat and they hate each other, same thing can happen. So even if I have shrimp and guppies that live together almost all the time, there have been times it doesn't work out very well. And so, you know, you might have that same situation. So have a backup plan and or just be ac accepting of the fact like, you know, I just lost like $50 in shrimp. That sucked, you know, but hopefully you learned from it and you go, okay, next time I got guppies that love shrimp. I'm going to have to try this other technique here and you go from there. All right, let's see if I can grab some stuff from the main chat and get a drink real quick. What's the best corridor to try in a pond? If it was me and I was trying, I would try one of two. If I was on a budget, I would do albino corridors. If I was not on a budget, I would do um, Barbados corridors because they go cooler water and they're super cool and I would love to have four billion of them. So that's why. <laughs> Let me talk to you about this car's extended warranty. Ah, see, I got to get in the game. I'm going to start selling aquarium co-op feeders with the warranty. <laughs> you know 5% of these things just drop out of the sky, so you better buy that warranty, only $29.99, let me tell you. <laughs> All right. Good day, Corey, just wondering what, uh, whether, yes, whether, not, not whether like the weather, but whether there is much of a market for rainbow fish in the Melotenia, Meloteniade, oh, I can never... I always say Melotania, but then it's Melotania Cichlidae. Melo so I can say Cichlidae. Cichlid, Cichlidae is that family. Melotenia Day? Yeah, Melotenia Day. Family. Specifically, Eastern Rainbow Fish. Melio. My brain is not catching up with me today. Melotenia Splendidia Splendidia. Let me Google Melotenia Splendidia because I want to see how it looks. Melanotania splendi. That is the Eastern Rainbow Fish, as it's called. I think there is an okay market for it, but for me, it's like a it's like a souped up Toyota Camry. And what I mean by that is like you could just get an Australian Rainbow for like four bucks at a retail store that the males fired up will look almost as good as these things where this thing you're probably gonna have to sell for like 14 bucks and people are be like isn't that just the australian rainbow and you're like nah it's a slightly cooler version you know like this i really tricked out this 2002 toyota camry so do i think there is much of a market my my question would be why so if it's like you got it in its breeding, yeah, there's some. But if you're like, I'm a breeding, I'll make money, then I'd be like, well, why not do like green or red dragons or bosmoni or turquoise where males and females both look good, right? Or dwarf neons or any of the pseudomoguls, like any of those that kind of have a known better market. Now, what usually happens is like, well, I got a crush on this fish and I just want to breed this one. I want to save the planet. It's going extinct, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I totally get that but I don't think there's gonna be a huge, huge market for that specific fish. All right. Mm. For many for many pawns this year, let me process, first, okay. My brain is either not working or this sentence doesn't make sense. First many pawns this year ever had problems with jumping. Four of my platies jumped. Also, our clients are similar. Ever done South American cichlids and ponds? Uh, I've never done South American cichlids and ponds. That's something I haven't done. I, like, never have troubles with jumping. That being said, I mean, I make sure there's, like, four inches of room so they don't just zing out of there. But usually you have the most jumping potential right when they're new. So, you know, give yourself some headroom so they'd have to, like, really sail out of that thing and then, well, I guess that's, I guess I could, I could kind of chime in on that. By leaving that water level quite down, you don't get a lot of jumpers, and then it's going to rain anyway. And so one of the reasons I do that is 
all that easy green I squirted in there, right? I don't want it to rain a ton and just like wash out. So I give it some headroom of like, oh, there you go. <coughs> now there's some other things I do too. I, I don't have it here, but half the time, half the time. If I got it laying around, I will just dump tons of live bacteria in there too, just to like jumpstart. Or if I'm late on the season, Right now, we're super early. Being the end of April, we are ooh, real early on this season. We're at the good spot. But there's times when I'm ready to do this. And pretty soon, it's like, oh, gosh, 4th of July is in two days. I better get on it. And then I need bacteria right away and all that. So, yeah, leave it down a bit. And you shouldn't have too much jumping problem. What's the minimum size container for a pond for a beginner? I think it's about 17 gallons. Half whiskey barrel, that blue tote, any of those... I mean, I, bigger is better from my own experience, but those are the smallest that I've had success with, and I do smaller fish in them. Like, I think last time I did, the whiskey barrel was, so whiskey barrel at one time was live brine shrimp. So I made a brackish one, and they breed, their brine shrimp are live bears when they're happy. Uh, so I had a brackish one. I also did uh, Mary Widow's live bears, which is a dwarf live bear in that. Um, I've done cherry shrimp in that before. And then I kind of uh, upgraded I never really did small ponds the, the few years after that because they were just I felt limited in what I could do and and plus they broke right like that thinner plastic just kind of and then when I went to buy something new I was like ah oh, let me just buy something better so all right where am I at here Stanley the ten dollar what do I think of safety zorb as a substrate um, it's super dirty ask my wife you'll stay in your bathtub and you get in a fight with your spouse about it, but it's a very cheap substrate that has uh, a high cation capacity. So it's all right. Yeah, I would. I, I put it on the. At this point in my life, ain't no time for that. Like it's too much work, and like ugh, I'd I'd, I'd sooner just buy from my local fish store or Amazon some like uh, uh, Eco Complete or or something comparable to that, if that's the look I want. Got three nano tanks filled with large and healthy red cherry shrimp. I got pest snail shells are piling up in all the tank corners. So are the red cherry shrimp eating the snails? Uh, likely what's going on is probably the shrimp are kind of hitting that boom population. When something booms, usually another population busts. And so... With all these shrimp going to town, they're probably winning the food war. They're getting the majority of them a calcium out of the water and all of that. And snails, they only thrive when there's excess food. And if all your snails are eating, or not, not snails, if all of your shrimp are eating everything, there's not a whole lot of food left over. So you usually get a little bit of starvation. And then, um, yeah, it's not uncommon to get boom bust populations like that. And that's the best way to get rid of snails is don't have leftover food. I bet I would wager if you really started overfeeding that tank, which I don't recommend, but if you did, over three to six months, you'd see that shrimp population explode, but then maybe some snails come back. The other way would be remove like 60% of those shrimp, feed the same amount. You'd probably watch the, uh, the snails start making a comeback. <clears throat> $20 from Samuel. How has Murphy been doing lately? Has he grown much this year? I'm glad to see he's looking great on the cam right now. Yes, that dude is becoming a beefcake. He's beefy for sure. We've got him on uh, oysters, harder clam shells. His teeth were getting big, and he was just tearing through the clams. We were feeding him at a breakneck pace. So we've been, well, I shouldn't say we. Robert's been going to basically the fish market and picking out clams and, and, and uh, oysters and feeding them. But I would say he's doing well. He's getting a little agitated. He wants to hang out with people. He's used to seeing more people than just our employees. So, <clears throat> But I think he's doing all right. All right. I think when I ordered some water spray from you guys, I got some Hydra Hitchhikers. Tips for treating them before I pop them into the tank. Um, if you got them, the treatment for them is usually flubendazole. Otherwise, some fish will eat them like garamis and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I can't confirm or deny whether hydra is there. Normally, if hydra comes in with plants that we get, um, it'll develop in some tanks and we would treat it. I haven't seen it. Like, 
I haven't seen Hydra probably like 18 months to two years. I'm not, I, for sure, I would never say, like, you didn't get that from us. How dare you? Like, no, no, no. There is always, always that chance, you know, because these plants are coming from open air systems around the world, and each farm runs its own ecosystem, and so there's always chance for stuff to come in. But in general, because we don't have a lot of stuff in our water, it would die out if it was there. Um, but yes, someone else earlier in the chat, they just happen to have some Hydra and uh, <clears throat> uh, Flubendazole, Garamis. I think copper takes care of it, but we don't like to really dose copper because it's hard on plants, hard on snails and shrimp and all that kind of stuff too. Um, yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the life cycle of Hydra is. So if you just put it like in a bucket and let it sit there with some light, I'm not sure. Two Bros Aquatics is a new member. How's it going, buddy? And Flynn's Fish Forum with $5. That's right. Got my buddy Flynn's money. <laughs> don't worry, I'll pay you back, Flynn. I'm sure I'll give you some samples next time you're around. I have a pond snail in my shrimp tank gobbling up Hydra like a champ. Hmm. I mean, I guess I wouldn't be surprised like a mono shrimp did that. Uh, I know there's the spixie snails that will eat it. There are things that will eat it. I, I so rarely run into it in my aquariums with adult fish. It's only when, I usually see it most prevalent when you're raising up fry, like super teeny fry, because there's nothing big enough to eat it. But I'm not saying it couldn't, but, you know, guppies and uh, a lot of the stuff I keep, I think just naturally eat it. Uh, I've got some cheap coarse gravel from Home Depot for a substrate. It's mainly crushed granite. What fish should I avoid stocking in there? Corydoras, geophagus, plecos, rams? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily avoid anything. Like the geophagus, if the rock's big enough, they won't tumble it anyway. Corydoras, depends on the food you feed. Like some of them live on very rocky substrates. Plecos live on tons of rocks. Tip well, it depends on the one, but lots of rocks. Uh, but in general, the type of substrate I have doesn't dictate the fish I keep. It's It might dictate the food and how you feed. Maybe you flo feed floating food as opposed to sink food or something like that. But, um, yeah. <clears throat> how do I grow java moss quickly? You don't. That's why it's hard to come a hold of. So, like, it's a slow-growing plant. You can grow it fast if you grow it immerse, so out of water, but then when you put it underwater, it crashes. So you're like, oh, I had this much job moss. I put it underwater. Now I have this much. Oh, and then it takes a year to get this big again. So I don't think anyone's got dialed in to growing job moss super fast. The faster you try and grow it, typically the more algae start growing and the more problems you start getting going on. And I don't think there is the whole uh, supersonic speed on that. If you're adding a heater to a mini pond, would you use a standard heater, like a stick heater, or is there something else? Um, I've always used the standard heaters because that's what I already had. Now, when back when back in the day when I did the math, <clears throat> a 300 watt heater running 24 hours a day was $20 a month to run. Now, adjust for inflation, where you live, maybe it's 30 or 40 bucks now, whatever it is, still seems pretty good if you got another month or two out of your fish um but in general i i found it was more efficient and more fun to work on like solar passive heating and some other ways to do it and that the heater itself it just it gave me that false sense i got a heater and it's gonna be fine and then it was like oh geez it's actually dropping it's having a hard time keeping up and so it, it gave me that false sense of security that it just never worked out as well as i wanted it to and i'm better off like trying to fix it using nature, I guess. Like, that sounds weird, but, you know, using that sunlight, trapping it, all that kind of stuff. Do I have any bucket list fish? Uh, no. The only bucket list fish I have is a fly river turtle. I think everything else... I can't think of... Well, no? Maybe anableps are still on there, the four-eyed live bear, brackish water fish, possibly. I don't think there's any true, like, oh my gosh, I can't get my hands on the fish. I really, really want to keep it. Most things I've actually just acquired at this point. 
And you can, you know, now that, you know, we have a business around fish, I can justify anything. Like, oh, let me buy that. It's for the business. People want to see it. Because even if people didn't think it was super cool and I thought it was super cool, it would make for a good video because I'd be so passionate about it. So, there's not... All the stuff that I probably want is stuff I don't know exists yet. Like a color variant or something I haven't seen before. But uh, there's nothing, like the list would be very small if I had one. Can I point out some baby goldfish behind me? I don't know if you can see it. There's one, there's two right there. People come up to my finger. I don't know if you guys can see it on camera. Maybe you can like uh, CSI enhance a couple of times into that. But that one's pooping. That one's doing okay. Two more over there. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's like an al or a melanistic one. That's kind of cool. So there's seven of them right there that I can see. And they've been growing like weeds, I swear. My wife, you know, Dorico, was even shocked when uh, she came up. What? Like, because they were like this. And then like a week and a half later, they're just like, because I'd start feeding them. Once I noticed they were there, got the food, you can get 800 gallons of auto water change and, you know, they eat. Once you get those tacos going right through them, whoo, grow like a weed. All right. The job moss on wood has become my dwarf puffer collection nest. Hmm. They must be laying eggs on there for you. Good times. Will the Fluval 3.0 on the rim of a tank, burn floating plants. I'm trying to soak up extra nutrients. Uh, not in my experience. I mean, I don't think it'll get hot enough. And I don't think it's too much light. I mean, I've never, there's always that corner case of like, but I've never run into that myself. The only thing that really hurts floating plants when they get wet, they hate getting wet. Can a gravel size be too small for under gravel filter? At a certain point it gets so fine you're trapping everything and it'll clog quickly and you wouldn't want it to go through the pores but otherwise no I mean there's kind of you know everything in this world there's like oh here's the range in which it works pretty good and then it's like oh here and here like a boulder this big not too good for your under gravel and then also like something as fine as flour not good for your under gravel either but there's a huge range in there of like oh if it's meant for an aquarium yeah it's probably okay-ish Russell M coming through with the sweet five dollars. Well, thank you, Russell. Ooh, and Danielle. Wait, Danielle or Raymond twelve. So by the way, I if you guys so one we're kicking total butt with memberships. Yeah, we broke the thousand mark. So we have a thousand members now, which is amazing. And there's seven YouTube trolls right now that their minds just exploded going, this guy, you know how much money he's getting? Yeah, it's a decent amount of money. I thank you guys for that. That's what's kept us going through. Employees are fully staffed. Good times. Appreciate that. But YouTube is taking our notice and they're putting us in all kinds of test pilot programs. We get to, you know, I had to sign NDAs just the other week. We got, I'm signed up for all kinds of shenanigans where I got to answer survey. I signed, fill out a survey today. Uh, but the, my point was, if you're gonna kick us five bucks, which I appreciate, uh, make sure you're a member. So if you're not a member yet, become a member, because that just cost you five bucks anyway, and you get some benefits, right? Especially if it's like, hey, just thanks for being cool, here's for five bucks. Uh, membership is a great way to say that. So, and I, I already know there's some countries it's not allowed in. I, I yell at YouTube, not daily, but like monthly for like, hey, why isn't it available in you know, I think the last one was Algeria. We have someone who wants to sign up and they can't sign up. It's a giant pain in the butt and, you know. All right. Uh, I bugged you on the private thread. So forget the re-ask. How dare you be a re-asker. Kidding. That's not a thing. The auto feeders. Did I miss the opportunity or will you re-offer? They are on the super secret squirrel menu. To access that menu, you have to uh, email shipping at aquariumcoop.com with uh, the secret code word super secret squirrel auto feeder candy. You are so great. Could you please give me the link so that I could purchase those after acknowledging all of the little little rules that come along with that? 
And then Candy will go, Oh, Corey, why are you telling people to do this? I'll never find time to bake you cookies now. At home, she's doing this because she's the best uh, customer service person ever, and she would never relay that to me. But she'll be cursing my name, and then she'll get you that link, and you'll be able to buy some, and then eventually we're going to run out, and then everyone will be sad, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do. So they might be reoffered at some point. We're still trying to really just dial them in, though, because it's... I only want to offer them again after we've really truly exhausted can we make them better or B, uh, we make them better. I don't want it to be like, ah, oh, people are throwing money our way. Let's just do it. Just do it. That's, you, you, you make that one exception and now you've done it again and pretty soon you're just, you know, selling crap. So it really, I have to truly be able to look you guys in the eye and go, look, we really tried to fix it. We tried. The, the company's not willing to do it or they can't figure it out or whatever. Here is, here's the disclaimer. I do love these things. That type of deal. Wait, floating plants hate getting what? Yes. Uh, so typically what happens is you get water on the top of that plant. And it, it's okay. Let me, let me back it up here. Camera's going crazy. Yes, for the photographers out there. No, I have not auto-locked my white balance. <laughs> anyway. When you look at the top of floating plants, you know how it kind of looks like a cat's tongue? It's got that weird texture to it. That's to repel water. Now, that usually causes water to bead up on it. Not bead up, but bead, like a bead of water, right? So you get that bead of water on there. Now, when you get a lot of light, ugh, really going like that, it works like a magnifying glass and it can like burn little holes and just some reason it does not like being wet. I don't know if it's like a burning thing. I don't know if it's just what it is, but that's why we don't ship live plants is because we can't like we can't keep them from getting wet. So if they're completely dry, they arrive to you and they're all dried out and they just don't do well. If we keep them with keep them wet a little bit, they end up getting wet on there and you get it like there's like ah oh, it looks gross and there's like brown spots stuff like that because it got wet. So it's like a no win situation for these floating plants to ship them and have them look anything reasonably good now. Our competitors will, and they'll just be like, ah, screw it, just refund on their money. <laughs> like, what do we care? Like, we actually, we care because it, it makes us look bad. It's kind of like if you sell nice, let's say you sell Toyota Camrys and you got great ones. Like, you don't also sell the ones that look terrible. Like, oh, I've got an accident, but it's brand new. <laughs> sell it, give them a good deal. Just keep doing that all day long. It's going to make it look like, why do you have so many Toyota Camrys? They're always, like, wrecked and bad, right? It, over time, will give you a negative perception. So, and we don't want, we really, you know, believe it or not, we actually care what customers think about our company. So, you know, we don't like doing things that leave you guys with a bad experience. The goal is you give us your hard earned money. And when you open it, you go, wow, this is better than I thought it was going to be. Not, you know, oh, I would have thought they would have done better. And there are times in which, you do get that experience and I wish we could make it right. And what I mean by that is like, there is quite a few people that go, I can't believe we shipped this Fluval light in the original box, even though it's meant to be shipped that way. It's damaged by USPS. It makes us look bad. Now we could put it in another box that makes the shipping costs go up by like double because a four foot box that's this by this costs like $5 just for the box. Then you oversize that thing and now you ship it. It's like an extra eight bucks to ship it. So now a $22 light, add another $13 in shipping, and then when that thing gets hit by USPS anyway, it's gonna go through both boxes and we're still gonna look bad. So keep the price down. We'll just take it on the chin of like, I'm sorry, we obviously warranty it. If anything was ever wrong, we'll take care of you. And you know, if, if all of a sudden boxes get super cheap, hey, we'll start throwing them in another box. But four foot boxes, Aren't coming down in price. I'll tell you that right now. If anything, they're going up. So, yeah. Where, where did that tangent even start? I don't know where that tangent started, but hopefully I answered the original question. I can't even see it on here. I don't know. I don't know anymore. I don't know. Oh, it was, it was about the floating plants. Alrighty, Rue. Oh, and Danielle was asking, where are my pups? The pups are uh, eating bones on my bed right now. Tinky made us laugh quite hard when I tried to take her bone. She's very protective and I distracted her and she's got cat-like reflexes. So, and latest on the bones, they're coming in much more smoky. They smell like smoked cheese. So, 
You might have to ask, what's up? Manufacturer, why are your bones so smoky? Because once they get dog slobber on them, now it's like, what? Is that smoked dog slobber? What is that smell? That's the one thing I, downfall I got with dog bones, like raw hides and all that. You get that dog slobber on there and pretty what is oh geez that smells terrible you know and you we got little dogs that hang out with us so it's not like you can be like hey giant dog go eat that outside like our little our little dogs are like i just you know even look at them we're like oh i didn't do anything wrong no you didn't do anything wrong we just got stinky bones all right long time viewer recent member thank you very much I want to say thanks for all the content i'm a manager at a fish store right on fighting the good fight hopefully i mean you could be like you know, world worst fish manager, but probably not. Uh, in Canada, I've been playing videos your store all month. I like it. We gotta ask. Anything tastes as bad as six year old fish food? Um, what have I tasted that's been real bad? I feel like I've tried something in China where I was like, oh gosh. But that six year old fish food, it just tasted like six year old rust like if you ever worked on a super old car in the middle of summer and like something falls in your mouth like oh that's what it tasted like but i i feel like i've got suckered into something in a foreign country where oh no i know it tasted almost as bad as that when i ate those dehydrated bugs at aquashella i in fact that was worse because the amount of upset upset stomach and burps for the rest of the night meanwhile it was like worst thing ever because it's like upset stomach, tasted horrible. I'm burping whatever the smell of dehydrated scorpion and other bugs are. Meanwhile, I still got to like shake hands and talk to talk to you guys. And meanwhile, I'm like, oh, God, I, I want to puke right now. <laughs> that was not a good time. But yeah. Thomas Giblin. Uh, love your work. Awesome. Thanks for listening. Moving to Canada in a couple years. Can't wait to come visit the store. Love from Australia. Australia to Canada. Gonna be cold, buddy. Maybe you can move uh, to where Icarus Newton is. Or to know a fish store manager. My first live stream bought a bottle of Easy Green. I really appreciate what you're doing for that. Thank you. By the way, I've been studying Easy Green and the results are in i need to promo the heck out of this more because we don't sell proportionally as much as i think we should like sales are going up and all that across like we're doing you know better than we did five years ago but like easy green it was always our number one seller and right now it's actually our number two seller because we have another product that sells even better but i think this should be our number one product because i think it's the best thing we've ever done and so I'm going to talk about it more and tell you guys to buy it more. I mean, I use it all the time. My wife's using it for house plants. Randy's using it for house plants, fish room. Like, it's a great thing. But what I find over time is, and by the way, Sunday's video is proof of this. Every month we get like 10 to 15,000 new people to the channel. If I forget to talk about Easy Green for four or five months, which I do all the time, that's like 70,000 people that have never even seen this mentioned. And it's like our number one coolest thing we've ever done. So I'm trying to be more, I'm like, keep it on the desk, trying to be more active, like, wait a second. And so that Sunday video, same logic there, like YouTube's like, dude, you can do, like highlight some of the coolest stuff you've ever done on the channel. You've done a thousand videos. You've got some things that did really well. The newer people to your channel, the statistics just show they don't watch older stuff. And so I had Jimmy put that video together and it's, so there were a few of you guys that were like, can't believe you did a compilation video. How dare you, Corey? which is cool, I get it. My only reply to that is like, we're locked down under quarantine, guys. I don't have a whole lot to film and I'm running out of stuff. Now don't get me wrong, we got a new video coming out. You know, we were trying to mix it up, spice it up. You know, instead of having hot dogs for dinner seven nights in a row, we decided tonight's taco night, let's try something new. But don't worry, we got a new video for you on Sunday. It's not a compilation or anything, but I will say that compilation video is number two what does that mean so out of the last 10 videos we released it's number two not our best video but it ain't our worst so what that shows is stuff that's crazy good from the past is still crazy good now and a lot of you guys that are new to the aquarium co-op extravaganza haven't seen it and so 
I have given, so part of me, I have to keep Jimmy busy. You know, I myself forget. We have a full-time video editor, and if I can't leave the house, there's only so much I can film here and do. And so I got to keep him busy. And I was like, hey, let's try this thing. YouTube's been harassing me. Let's see what it, if, it, if it does horrible, I'll never do it again. Well, it did well. So we're going to find ways to mix that in here and there. It might be, oh, Corey got sick. It might be an extra video a week. I don't know where we're going to do it yet. That was just the very first one. We'll try another one in you know, a few weeks or a month or two months, whatever it is, and we'll see how it goes. But yes, where, I don't even know. Oh, you got your first bottle of Ysagrin. That's how that story came up. But yeah, so don't worry. It's not like we're just doing compilations from here on out. Don't worry about that. I was purely trying to appease the YouTube gods. Also wanted to see... Would this even work? And I will say this with 100% genuine truth here. Like I've never been more true. I was against this idea for the last six months. 100% against it. But I was like, all right, Jimmy's got to do something. I, I can't just like give this guy the infinite break, like pay him to do nothing. Not that he doesn't do anything. He was doing other, he takes pictures, does a lot of stuff for us. But they were starting to get lean on work. And I was like, all right, let's make the YouTube guys happy. Let's try this. And then I watched the proof. So, I mean, he did a version, and I was like, oh, my gosh. This is actually, like, really good because the nostalgia hit me, and I got all excited about these fish farms again. I was like, these, this is just good video. I don't care who you are. I was there. I've watched the proofs before. I released these videos, and now a year later I'm watching it in person, and even I'm jazzed. I'm going, oh, yeah, I forgot. Man, those Brian Chimhatries were insane. Oh, my gosh, those Dark Knight Rams were super cool. i got to go back to Israel. This is amazing. And so I, I watched that 10-minute video, and I'm feeling great. And I'm like, you know what? We're releasing this. I feel great about it. I still think it's amazing. I think people who haven't seen it are going to think it's amazing. I've seen it six times, and I've been there in person, and I watched it. Don't get me wrong, there are videos that I basically don't watch from like, yeah, it was a talking head video. I know what I said. I did it. Jimmy will do it right. I don't need to watch it again. But then there's videos like Charles Clapsaddle tour. Any, any of the tours we do, I love to relive the experience because when I'm there, I'm too much doing this. You know, I'm too much in the moment of like, all right, is my camera lens? Is it fogging? No, okay, we got it. Am I too shaky right now? All right, audio is probably pretty good. All right, yeah. All right, a different angle. Mm-hmm. And so you guys will criticize me a lot for going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's because my brain is racing going, all right, what's the next logical thing they're going to want to talk about? How do I set up the shot? What should I ask them? Oh, they're great. No, people are going to ask to show that. Oh, can you tell me more about how you sort that fish? So my brain is racing, and that's why you get a lot of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And a lot of times, sometimes the talent on the other side of the screen They'll just look at you waiting for confirmation. Like, so I'll say like, oh, how long until, you know, for raising this fish up till you sell? Three months. And you're like, oh, oh yeah, okay, okay. So they're different, like you almost have to prompt and get it. And a lot of times we'll cut all of that out. And so you're not seeing sometimes the beginning 10 minutes of getting someone comfortable on camera is really hard. And so you find out what kind of an interviewee this person's going to be and what your job as the cameraman and interviewer is going to play in this role. And so, and then there's also a lot of times when we're in foreign countries, there's time limits. So it's like, oh my gosh, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen over there. Because I promise you this, like in that video with Ran, which I'm desperately trying to go back there, he would have never taken us to show us the brine trip hatchery because he's just like, yeah, it's a brine trip hatchery. I run four of them here. I have 10 fish farms. You run them every farm. What do you care? But that was like one of the coolest things for me. And so I have to like go over there and he's very proud of his fish and his fish are rad. Don't get me wrong. But I want to see some of the other stuff. Like I want to see the green water. Yeah, going. I want to see all the stuff that's like, oh yeah, that's a thing. I want to see all that stuff. And so, but yes, that's why we did the compilation video and I liked it. And I still like it. And I stand behind that one. And I'm not going to just make stupid, like, like, you know, top 10, my top 10 videos and that kind of stuff. Like, I want it to be truly highlight some of the best stuff we've ever done and get it seen again. Because there is content that, one, I can't go back and do. Two, uh, it's just that good. And I think that it just needs to be resurfaced. And we're, we've, you know, we're trying different strategies. And the whole goal was, like, let's show you... I think we showed you four farms, and if you fell in love with one of them, you clicked up to the link and went and watched the full tour. That's like an hour long, but uh, yeah, I, I still like it. So while I'm defending it, I'm just uh, giving you guys the logic behind it. And buy more Easy Green. Buy more Easy Green. That's all I know.
Okie dokie. Where did I leave off? Here's some taco time money. Don't live close enough to wash them for them, but have a burrito for me. I will, uh, I will do that, Tony. I now have the app on my phone. <laughs> because of the whole virus thing, I order remotely. So usually like tomorrow. Tomorrow would be a perfect candidate, but I have a meeting with a developer. But drop off the plants, order a burrito on my phone, pick it up through the drive-thru, woo! And I've been, a, I've been a sucker for those kids' burritos at the moment. Beef and bean kids' burrito with a little bit of sour cream and guac. Woo. That's right. Not necessarily a taco. Sometimes I get the burrito. Jim Budness William Chung became a new members. Thank you very much. We have nine new members so far this stream. I appreciate it. Eric McMurtry. Makes my day when I get the live video notification. I done watched your recorded video or two here every day. I like to give you guys voices and personas because it keeps it fresh and entertaining for me. And by no means is this meant to be derogatory or anything like that. It just sometimes it makes it more fun because I, I try to mix it up so it's not just monotone. You're in a podcast and what I can't understand, can't understand, can't stand is when someone just reads the chat like, I have guppies and white clouds. The white clouds had babies. Could it be the guppies eating the eggs? And then someone goes, yes. And then they go, oh, I put three neon tetras in my honey garami breeding pair. The male beat up the female instead of fending off the tetras, so I had to remove her and the tetras. Now there's a bunch of tiny neons in there. Oh, I inject a calcium supplement into my saltwater tank, into my cherry shrimp tank, and have had great success better than before. Like that just gets like, oh man, I cannot tolerate that. So I try to add a little bit of character to it, spice it up for myself. And I'm hoping that that leads to one, it breaks up the statements. Like if you're just doing something at work and you're like, oh, a different voice, different thing means subject change and that. And uh, I, I do, I believe it or not, I practice trying to read and uh, give what I'm reading life at the same time because that's what I enjoy. You know, it's kind of like someone's hired to do a book on tape. You're like, wow, this person's really good at reading. You know, and in school, I was terrible when people would have to like read stuff aloud, like, oh God, it's the robot. You know, I was just not good at doing it. Uh, and so I, I practice that. And that's something that I like to do. So I'm always afraid that someone's gonna be like, this guy's making fun of someone. No, 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 not. Just trying to, trying to have some fun. Mitzi Morris says, please tell me how to, get, how to keep my quarter-inch baby dwarf puffer alive and happy. Well, in a perfect world, you'd probably have some cultures, maybe some seed shrimp, maybe some daphnia, maybe some vinegar eels, all that kind of... Well, vinegar eels might be a little too small at this point. Uh, maybe some white worms. But a live food culture is where I'd be shooting for. If you don't have any of it, I'd probably hop on Aquabid and start ordering some up. Uh, for the most part, right now... I would be trying frozen foods if you can get your hands on them. But I don't have any specific tips. Well, snails too. Like if you got a whole snail army, what you can do is like if you had a snail tank, you're breeding them, put that baby in there. He can eat, pick off all the little snails. They're going to breed and they're going to breed. They're going to breed. Eventually he's going to get like, oh, he's half inch and he's murdering. That's when you put him back into a main tank. Go, okay, no more murdering spree. You're big enough to eat frozen blood worms and that kind of stuff now. Tyler Barton Bravehearts 1986, welcome to the team, my friends. And Tyler hit me with a $15 super chat, dang. So that's on top of the membership. That's $20 spent. Hey, I was hoping you could offer me some tips on breeding peppered corridors specifically. I would uh, uh, greatly appreciate it. I'm not having much luck. So my trick to corridors is food, food, food. I specifically like to use giant batches of rapashi. And so I don't know how many have. Let's say you got a six pack of those things. I'd be feeding enough rapashi so that 24 hours after you fed, there's still rapashi for them to eat. Now you're going to go, that's an insane amount of rapashi. Yes, it is. Because they're going to eat, they're going to eat. It's going to look like their bellies are huge. I found that to be one of the best triggers. When food is abundant, it helps condition the females. And then also it proves to them that there's going to be food for their babies. So you might have to do that like, I would say do that 24 hour food amount like once a week for three or four weeks and you'll probably start getting some breeding activity out of them. You're going to put weight on those females and the males 
and you're gonna have to do some extra water change as a result probably and all of those things are gonna work hand in hand to really start getting some of those numbers out of that those pepper corridoras now you could do it with live black worms or something like that but those are harder to get your hands on but I would typically put in half a pound to a pound of live black worms to live in the substrate and really just let them gorge all week long uh, in like something like a 40 breeder so but that was very expensive and they were pretty high-end corridors we were breeding they would sell at 20 plus dollars a piece so it made sense to invest that money but uh yeah the rapache i like it because it, it's it's water stable for a very long time and I, you, I would just do something like community blend i don't think you specifically have to do bottom scratcher or or any particular one i just like the community one that's the one i typically use a lot of well i used to use a lot i, I don't have time for it now i'm I keep telling myself, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I just I haven't been. Are underground filters good or bad? If good, how would you hot rod it? Uh, I'm going to put them in the good category. Hot rodding it, I would say you don't need to. They're already like ridiculously good. I just wouldn't hot I mean, a couple of air stones and an underground. I run one in the sump in the 800 gallon. I just honestly think they're really good. I just think they're expensive to get a hold of because they're not sold in mass quantities they're difficult to ship but if you got one laying around i think they're good use a moderately sized uh substrate and gravel back every once in a while that's about as hot rods you need to go our diaphragm air pumps the only options for 30 gallon tanks not the only option the options you would have would be uh like our usb nano air pump which we're sold out of so that's a great sales pitch when we have it again in a month you should buy one of those that's what we're running this 800 gallon tank with those little mini pumps or doing something like this bad mamma jamma if you got a whole bunch of tanks you could run this linear air piston pump and hook them all up together and run it that way the downfall to diaphragm pumps is i should do a whole episode on that i never even thought about that i could show you what the diaphragm actually looks like the parts that wear the magnets and all that but the, the downfall with them is typically the rubber that compresses all the time it's the part that uh, wears and once there's a little hole in it it doesn't move the air anymore so you have to buy the new diaphragms and that process of them going back and forth is what caused the vibrating sound and so you can actually hot rod some air pumps by the way by bending the metal so that the magnets swing harder you can actually get more air out of it you might get uh, more flexion in the diaphragm so you'll have to replace the rubber pieces more often but you can get you know it's one of those hot rod in that air pump a little bit more but they do get a little louder from doing that um but those you know unfortunately we really only have a couple types of air pumps and at a certain point they only get so quiet and well you're not that you're only looking for quiet right you're just looking i assume that people ask they're asking for alternatives because they're of noise but uh, there are some other options, I would say. The other, other thing you could technically do is use a power head with a venturi system. So the venturi system sucks air in. So you'd have a power head moving water, and you put an air line up to the surface. And it would suck air in and push out bubbles. So that would be another way you could technically do something like that. Why are pea, puffles, pea puffers not profitable to breed? Uh, I think it's because you have to do it in massive quantity. They don't have a super high um, wholesale value, and they're being done at the farm level. And so, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I think not enough being sold. You have them being produced at farms. They are plentiful in the wild, so that keeps price down. Yeah, I think those are the reasons. You could maybe launch a whole campaign like like the saltwater people have done, like here's our home raised and we should support that and all of that, and that would that would help you, but I don't know how many people in the freshwater world are ready to get behind that yet. Uh Shara Demur re upped and became a snail. Well thank you. Stanley Morales uh, if you and the missus ever come to LA, I'll show you real tacos and burritos. Uh oh, don't they can't be too spicy. I'm a real wimp when it comes to that. But yes, um, I, I am the guy. I'm really coming around to it. I I have every taco truck I see when I'm like in Hawaii and and at the uh, the my brain don't work farmers market that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I if we're being real here. A man of my stature loves all food. I just love to have my shtick of crunchy tacos are the best. 
which they are the best, by the way. But, uh, you know, if if it's like, oh, eat this salad or eat this soft taco, a.k.a. burrito, I'll eat the burrito. There's there's no doubt about it. Like, oh, you're, you're world famous street tacos? Yes, I'm going to eat them, right? Like there's, but yes, I... I will say, I will say from traveling the lands far and wide, everyone on the planet has their favorite taco spot. I'm going to tell you this right now. They are not all equal. If you're in the middle of like Wisconsin or something, that is not the same caliber of Mexican food as, let's say, Texas, as Washington, as Oregon, as Idaho, like don't get me wrong, I still eat them in every state because Mexican food is amazing and I love it. I'm just saying, it's like Indian food and that kind of stuff. There's different regions, you know, where things are really good. Like when I go when I go to Florida and that kind of stuff, getting bisques and gravy. Like there's just places that do things better than others. Where was I at? Florida, best fried chicken of my life because they did it in peanut oil. Woo! I have to go visit wild fish tanks again just to go have that again uh, yeah so yes taco tangent taco tangent tuesday all right we got some new members from ted Kim kempinski w marion dean or no deanne deanne yeah deanne wheeler and a super chat video idea what changes in the fi wait what changes fish slash aquarium when lights go off? Maybe wear night wear night vision goggles. Yeah, I mean there is some behavioral changes and that kind of stuff. I'm not sure I could quantify. I mean I can give some opinions on it and I know some things. I'd have to think about could I make this a good video though. There's a lot of stuff where I'm like, yeah, people don't know that. I'm like, but would anyone watch that? I don't know if anyone's gonna watch that. That's that's pretty dry, you know. I'm gonna get back into the main chat here. I feel like I'm neglecting you guys. Extra sour cream, I like it. Rachel, wondering would neocardinia shrimp survive in temps of 60 degrees Fahrenheit? And do you deliver to Canada? We don't deliver to Canada. We have some products available on Amazon Canada. Although when we run out, Amazon's not currently taking more. So you have to wait for those restrictions to lighten up if we run out. And neocardinia shrimp, in my experience, tolerated all the way down to 30 degrees. So Fahrenheit. Now that wasn't every that wasn't every uh, variant. I only tested cherry shrimp, really, but yeah, that hopefully answers your question. For a smaller scale auto water changing, would you go with an aqua lifter plus a DIY overflow or a JBO dosing pump to do it all? Uh, I mean, I've tried the aqua lifter, and those things are garbage. What I mean by that is like they get clogged, they lose suction, like they, they work great for six months and then they flood your house. Uh, the JBO dosing pump, let me think about it, for auto water change. Yeah, I would, because yeah, you're not going to flood or anything, like I would probably use one of those, honestly, because I've, I've had those running for many, many years at the warehouse, at the store, and yeah, the pumpets do wear out, but for the most part, they work pretty good. And I think they're a decent value. So I would go with that. Ooh. What would you, wait, what would your process be for converting a hang on back to a cancer filter in a freshwater tank? Converting a hang on back to a cancer filter. I would just take the media and put it into the cancer filter. I pretty much never make that move. I I like canister or I like hang on backs more, but I usually run them in tandem if I was gonna do that. Um Yeah, but just putting the media in there, seed it. Has anything ever compared to Yesterdog? Yesterdog is amazing, by the way. That's there are things so like Israel, I would say weekly I, I want fresh hummus again. Yesterdog was very good in what Michigan and is it just Michigan? I think there's Michigan and one other place. There's like two. Of, I've been to two different Yesterdogs. I so when I, I know I like some because I've been there several times. Where did we go? Oh, I, I did fall in love with Five Guys when I visited KG Tropicals. Um, but yeah, I typically try and fall in love with someone that's eat the crap out of it while I'm there because I don't get to go back too often. So it's like if this is really good, I need to eat it three or four times and won't be back for a couple years. 
And then like Sonic, I like not Sonic, uh not White Castle. That place sucked. What was it? That's a secret menu. Zenzo took me there. Backyard Aquatics took me there. We go all the time. Jimmy loves it. We go there. It's a burger place. Brain doesn't work. It's got animal fries. Oh, but we always get that when we're by there. I just can't think of the name. Tucson, Arizona for Mexican. Bunch of first generation Mexican immigrants who open restaurants. Could be amazing. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll definitely line up to try some for sure. Although the best nachos I've ever had was in a food truck in New York. Oof, man, they were good. Hate New York. I just, as if you watch the beginning of the show, I don't like hanging out with ridiculously big crowds of people. That is New York City. So that place is like, ah. Uh, I, the way I describe New York is the only place in the world where you can go when you breathe in, you're breathing out, or you're breathing in someone else's exhale. And don't get me wrong, I've been in some crowded places in China, not the same as New York. New York has just got something about it where it's like, wow, this is a crazy loud sensory overload here, at least in Times Square. Like, it's pretty crazy there. Tips on breeding German Blue Rams and Pepper Corys. Not sure if my other chat went up. Heather Barton. Yeah, I got the pepper cory one, so maybe it's probably lagging behind, as in I took a long time to answer them, so hopefully you've gotten that by now. For German Blue Rams, I would tell you definitely watch the video Dean did, because he's a breeder extraordinaire when it comes to rams. But in general, keep them hot, 85, 86 degrees. Feed them a lot of brine shrimp, just feed them really well, and then get the right types of rocks or whatever uh, medium you want them to lay on. Those are the basic tips. I mean, getting them really healthy and deworming, depending where your original ones came from. Hopefully you don't want to get any from Malaysia because usually they have hormones. Getting them from a local breeder or at least a United State breeder helps a lot. Um, those are my basic tips though, because it, it's not crazy hard, but it ain't easy either. It's just mostly hatch and brine and, and raisin small fry. Alrighty. in and out Burger. Yeah, you got it, Quentin. Yes, in and out I mean, a lot of people said that. Like, 40 people said that. You just happen to be the one. So that's a perfect example, by the way. 40 people said that. I happen to zone in on Quentin's name. So that's how easy it is, is to miss everything and just be out of the loop. So I'm never willingly trying to ignore someone. That's not true. I do ignore people. But I'm here, it's just all a blur. It's all a blur. Grand Rapids, Michigan. I need to go out and visit... Um, Sergeant Tanks again. I see him like get active on social media again every once in a while. I'm like, oh, is he back? And then he kind of recedes back in. But you know, he's got a lot of cool project he does, projects he does. What's an effective way to treat a large piece of driftwood? I have a great piece I found, but I want to thoroughly clean it before it goes into my tank. Uh, if you could have like a, a brand new fresh garbage can, or I got this crazy idea, right? You go buy yourself a 100-gallon Rubbermaid tote. Telling your significant other, I need to pre-treat this piece of wood. You put it in there, you scrub it down, you do your thing with it, and you let it sit there, get waterlogged for maybe like a month. By the way, your water was turning green and it was getting ready and now it's a pond. Joke's on the significant other. <laughs> Don't want to tear it down. I mean, there's looks so much life in here. We'll take it down at the end of the season. Oh, now there's babies. I can't bring them in. Guess it's staying there year-round. My wife's going to kill me. She's learning all my secrets. What's the best medium for angelfish eggs? Uh, my favorite that I ever did over the years was actually, they don't make it anymore, was from Angels Plus. And it was a piece of acrylic that was bent with magnets and you could put it anywhere on the side of the tank. Uh, now we're mostly lazy and we just use uh, breeding cones. Work as well. I mean, they work just as well, but I really liked being able to take the magnet off and go stick it into a new tank. So, I mean, that's a product that I, I it's not worth a whole lot, but I, I do can, maybe I will have it made. Maybe I'll go to China and be like, look, just make this. And they're going to look at me like, why? And I'll be like, because it's, it's, if you're an angelfish breeder, which only one out of four billion of you guys are, you're going to be like, this is the thing. Yeah, that's the best. But not many will sell because not that many people need that. Kyle Quinnell, welcome, member number 15 of the show. Right on. Are you guys going to open the same day as the quarantine or slowly reopen? Please answer. Owen, I have no idea. 
Uh, supposedly, our governor is going to weigh in on that tomorrow, and we will see what is planned. Like, we technically could have been 100% open this whole time, but we wanted to make sure that we were taking adequate precautions for our customers and our employees. And so, I mean, I, I have had a little bit of chatting going on with uh, the managers and seeing like, well, let's see what they say. And then we'll make some determinations on our end. And, uh, but yes, I mean, people definitely are chomping at the bit to get back in the store, get things back to normal. We know that. And we definitely want your money. But at the same time, we want to make sure that everyone is safe. And it doesn't matter where you weigh in on that. No one is 100, has 100% the answer. We don't know. And so we want to take uh, mitigated risks. Like for one thing, right now, to get fish is stupid hard. So it doesn't make sense like, yeah, come on in, shop. Take a look at all the stuff we don't have. Right? So we got to get that kind of rolling in. And then like, okay, we do have a lot of fish to sell. All right, come on in. Let's do our thing. And so there's, you know, a couple pieces there, but we're working on it. And uh, trust me, we want to reopen as much as you want us to be open. You know, be more than curbside pickup anyway. All right. I wonder what, wait, I wonder what he hasn't been able to get away with considering he got the 800 gallon. What haven't I been able to get away with? Once I had the cover of it being a business, I can get away with anything fish related. All right. Got five minutes left, and then we're heading over to the Katie Tropicals live stream, and I'm going to get dinner. I don't know what my wife Katie has made yet, but hopefully it's something scrumptious. Uh, let's see here. How cold would you take rainbows in a pond? Probably down into the high 50s depending on the type some of the pseudomogals go pretty cold in the wild so i would i would have to uh look into that are we currently shipping yes we're shipping tons shipping volume is up you guys are at home you're bored you want fish crap we're sending it uh so we actually are working on hiring someone we have someone testing not testing uh doing their first trial day tomorrow so good luck to them I, I don't know if they're a fish person or not. Like, I've only read the the application and all that, and, and I haven't met him. I'll meet him tomorrow. So hopefully he's a good fit for our crew. Hmm. <laughs> my wife. Oh, Corey think he, he thinks he can do everything. That's that's one of my downfalls. Like, I... I genuinely believe I could probably, I mean, there's some things like I'm never going to win a marathon or something. Well, not a marathon, but an ever sprint race or something. Right. But I genuinely think anything that's crazy important to me, I could pull off in my life, but I'm a realist enough to know that'll never be that important to me. So I won't accomplish it. But there, I mean, if something's really important to me, hard to stop me. So it's, yeah, I, I've got a lot of determination when I need to have it. And then when I don't, I don't. Oh, gross. Baked Dinner's baked potatoes and peanut butter and jelly. Ugh. I mean, together. I mean, independently, they're good. By the way, last time we had lunch on the patio, my wife made peanut butter and jelly because I hadn't had that in probably years. She did more jelly than peanut butter. This is an outrage. Like, I don't know if I've ever weighed in on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but I'm going to set it straight. Two-thirds peanut butter, one-third jelly here, and some milk. That's how it's done. There's no, no debating here. Like, there's got to be a thick layer of peanut butter on that one side of the bread. In fact, if I was making it, which I wouldn't because I'm a horrible cook, yes, cooking peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, peanut butter both sides, and then one side gets, like, some strawberry jam or jelly. Then you put it like that. Just saying. Is there an aquarium plant that can go in a pond? Yes, pretty much every plant that can go in an aquarium can also go in a pond. Some of my favorites would be water sprite, dwarf aquarium lilies, uh, water lettuce. You can go to your local pond store, get some water hyacinth, stuff like that. We are going to need a uh, word of the day for the live stream. Hmm. Hmm. What can I troll? 
can I troll John and Lisa with? I gotta think of these beforehand. Welcome, Haley, by the way. Um, uh oh, my wife's coming. I can hear her it's on the attack with my doggies. Come here. Oh, you're laying down. Come here. You're laying down. <laughs> Fighting me. Oh. My word of the day. What was your word of the day? Uh, smoke. All right, yes, we're gonna do hashtag smoky bones. I'm sure he'll know. Oh, we couldn't take Tinky to the groomer. My wife had to do her nails ourselves, and now he did it. He took it really well. Oh, are you just hanging out, looming in the back? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because dinner's ruined and it started raining, so no barbecue. Oh, we were gonna have a barbecue, but it rained. So now we will go with Plan C. Tinky, you smell like smoky bones. Told you. She got smoky bone breath. Yeah. All right, well, it's 6 o'clock. Head over to KG Tropical's live stream. We got a new video uh, from Dean's, actually, coming out on Sunday. I might do a secret live stream. We'll see what the time allows. Tons of plants are coming into stock tomorrow. That being said, order all of them tonight, and make sure you buy Easy Green, an air pump, and all the other things. In fact, order tonight and tomorrow. Uh, and then, yeah, we want to put that new guy through his paces. So order a lot tonight, order a lot tomorrow. And we'll see how he does. But for now, I'm going to smell my, my dog. What do you think, Tiki? <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys next time. Uh, probably next Thursday, actually. I've been doing it every other week, but I've been... So I've been having a great time doing the live stream, but plant shipments have been landing right when I have to go get them and not be able to make this live stream. So I'm hoping that won't be that way next week and we can do two in a row for once. That'd be nice. Uh, so thanks to the 16 new members and all the old members. Don't forget to order yourself a shirt. And if you're a member, check out the community post, get your $5 off coupon for a shirt. Why not? And we'll see you next time. For now, say goodbye, Tinky. Bye-bye. That wasn't a very good dog voice because my voice cracked. Bye-bye. Bye, Tinky. Oh, my wife's cracking up. Uh-oh.